founder of the Vineyard Church Movement here uh, 30, 40 years ago. He tells the story of one day he was in bed. It was a Sunday morning, and him and his wife were uh, supposed to go to church that day, and he's laying in bed, and he's having this conversation with his wife. Man, I just don't want to get up. I don't want to go to church today. And this went on for about 20 minutes. They were talking back and forth. And finally, his wife said, John, get out of bed. You're the pastor. you got to go. <laughs> so if, have, you ever, have you ever thought or ever heard this question, who really needs the church? Have you ever thought that yourself? Have you ever had someone say to you, well, who really needs the church? I want to begin this message a little bit differently today. I want you to look at a neighbor if you are comfortable. If not, you don't have to do this. I know that we're in South Dakota. Whenever I ask anybody to do this kind of stuff, there's always all kinds of uncomfortable glances like, I hate you right now. So you don't have to do this. But if you have someone by you who's friendly, you can look at that person and you can say, you need the church. Let's do that on three. I'm going to go one, two, three, and you're going to say that. Ready? One, two, three. You need the church. Now, if you're online today watching us, you need to look at somebody at home, if you have somebody at home with you, and you need to say the same thing. You need to look at them and say, you need the church. Let's do that one more time. Here we go. Ready? You need the church. Now, if you didn't say you need the church because you're uncomfortable and you're a South Dakotan, you can look at me and say this, and you can do this at home too. You can look at me and say this, I need the church. Ready? One, two, three. I need the church. Let's talk about some ROM perspectives on the church. Here's a couple of statements that I've had thrown at me over the years, and uh, I'm limiting this to two examples today in the spirit of saving time to which I should get an amen. I'm going to say it again. I'm limiting this to two examples to save some time. Amen. Thank you. At home, you got all the time in the world, so just whatever. Um, listen to this first one. I don't need the church. It's me and Jesus, and that's all I need. I've had that stated to me numerous times. I don't need the church. It's me and Jesus, baby. I don't need anybody else. Think about that statement for a moment. It's fundamentally wrong. It's terribly selfish. It's saying, I'm okay, and I don't care about anybody else. Does that sound at all like the founder of the church, Jesus Christ? Would he ever say something like that? He loved people so much, he died that they would be saved from their sins. And the more you know Jesus, the more you really know his heart, the more you'll be concerned about others. So saying, I'm okay with Jesus, I don't need the church, is a terribly immature and selfish statement to make. Now, I wonder how frequently we as evangelicals, especially the evangelical movement, have unintentionally produced this result. Because we'll say frequently here, you got to have a personal relationship with Jesus. It's all about you and Jesus. Amen? We say that. You know, you're not going to get to heaven unless you know Jesus and receive him as your Lord and Savior. And we push and push and push this personal side of our Christian faith. And people naturally go to that side then. Well, okay, if I'm okay with Jesus, everything's okay, cool, I'm done. No, no. That's a, that's a basically flawed understanding of Jesus and his concern for others. Here's the second statement. I like Jesus. I just don't like the church. I've heard that stated a lot to me. I like Jesus. I just don't like the church. Now, I get the point of some of this. Such a one is saying, the church isn't what it's supposed to be. I see Jesus in the Bible. I see his teachings in the Bible. But I don't see the church that I go to aligning with that at all. So I like Jesus, but I don't like the church. And I understand some particular expressions of the church aren't that good. You okay with me saying that? And I'm going to expand your understanding of church as the morning goes on. It's way more than what we're just doing right now. But I understand that some particular expressions of church are unhealthy and not biblical. But get this, the church is not my idea. It's not some institutional idea it is the idea of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't allow himself to be separated from his bride, the church. The two go hand in hand. So the church is Jesus' idea. Let me give you this as a point. The church is Jesus' idea, and Jesus intends for his followers to be part of his church. 
In Matthew 16, Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples. And he asked a question that goes along the line, something like this, who do people say I am? And his disciples begin to give answers back to that uh, inquiry. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist, come back to life. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're other prophets. You know, I, I find this whole exchange super fascinating because the people knew Jesus was special. They just didn't know how to articulate it. And when they're saying that this is who they think he is, I'm thinking, boy, your theology is not very good. You know, this is like, I don't think about, I don't think he's going to bring and reincarnate somebody back. You know, that's just not how God works, right? Anyway, well, some of you say, well, in the end times, so, yeah, let's not go there, all right? You don't have any idea what I just said most of you, do you? Forget I said that. Talk to Randy Hanson. He'll explain it to you after church. Right here, raise your hand, Randy Hanson. He taught Revelation. He'll tell you what, what it just meant, okay, if you don't know what I meant there. Anyway, I don't have time. I don't even know why I'm doing this right now. Stop, Steve, stop. I'm stopping. All right. Have you ever wondered about these assumptions and why they would say that? They just knew Jesus was exceptional. So let's get to the conversation and look at it biblically here in John chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 16, excuse me. I'm going to read verses 15 through 19. Listen to what this says. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Who builds his church? Jesus Christ. Whose idea is the church? Jesus Christ. You're getting that? It's pretty clear here. And he goes on to say, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So the rock that Jesus is building his church on is not Peter. That's a misunderstanding of the scripture. The rock that Jesus is building his church on is a confession by Peter that he was the Christ. That's the rock that Jesus is building the church upon. I want us to stop for just a moment here. Take a break. At home too, online, I want you to take the same break with us. And we're going to praise Jesus, the rock, for just a moment. So I'm going to read to you Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 18, and it's just about who Jesus is. I want you to bow your head, lift your hands, close your eyes, or stare at me, whatever you want to do. It's totally up to you. Be comfortable. Same at home. You can do whatever makes you comfortable, but let's have just a moment of worship. Think about who Jesus Christ is as I read this scripture. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. That's our Jesus. That's the head of the church. If Jesus is removed from existence, we go, poof, we are no more. He holds all things together. Before all things was, he was. All things are made through him, and he holds everything together. And he is declared, I'm the head of the church. And church is his idea. Who needs the church is still the question we're trying to answer here. And I'm going to give you a, a short answer to that. Um, it's you and others. Just hold on to that thought. Because I'm going to share some more things with you today before we get to there. But we are supposed to understand that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. So when someone says, it's just me and Jesus, baby, that's small-minded. You okay with me saying it? That's selfish. That's small vision. That's not Jesus. That's not who we are. The followers of Jesus are supposed to be in love with this head 
of the church. And we're supposed to band together as radical followers. And we're supposed to be on the move, breaking down the gates of hell. Hell's on the defensive here. And the church of Jesus Christ is on the offensive. And we're supposed to be storming the gates of hell. And we're supposed to be bringing the dominion of the kingdom of Christ to bear on this world we live in. Amen? And we're supposed to do that together. We're supposed to be captured by that vision and by that Jesus who's big. It's way too small to say, it's Jesus and me, baby. That's just a small-minded statement. Whenever someone says that to me, they think they're cute and they think they got something down. I'm going, oh my goodness. That's such a wrong thought. How do I even begin to address it without, you know, sounding uh, too harsh? <laughs> We're in this series called Grown Up Faith. We're looking at this uh, big picture, this big story. The Bible's one big story that's going to show up here on the, on the screen. We're in this segment of, our, of the big picture uh, of the Bible called the New Covenant right now. And if you remember the old and the new uh, covenants mirror each other. They're all one story. We're in the new covenant section now. This is where Jesus Christ has come and instituted a new uh, covenant between the race of human beings and God that by grace through faith in him we can be born again. This is often called the era of the church. It's between the first arrival of Jesus Christ and the return of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we call this the era of grace. God's pouring out his grace that anyone that calls upon his name uh, will become born again and part of the church uh, of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful time to be alive. It's a wonderful time to be part of what God is up to. And so here's the short answer to our question, who needs a church? You and others. Now let me expand on that just a little bit. The church provides, the church provides an ongoing expression of Jesus that blesses you and it blesses others. So who needs the church? Short answer, you and others. Why? Because it's an ongoing expression. It's a new covenant expression. It's the era of grace expression uh, of Jesus Christ to yourself and to others. So let's look on the ongoing expression that blesses you. Let me just uh, detail this out a little bit. You are blessed by the church's many parts working together. You may not even realize this, but you are blessed by the many parts uh, of the church working together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're told that the body of Jesus... The church is made up of many parts, and the many parts are us, individual believers. We're the many parts that make up the church. And each part is gifted by the person of the Holy Spirit and is a needed part of the body to be an ongoing expression of the fullness of Jesus Christ. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't know you, right? Right? And the, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Together, these things provide, these various parts provide the expression of Jesus Christ. Now, when I hear someone say, I don't need the church, you know what I see? I see them as a big honking foot going, oh, I don't need anybody else. I'm fine being a foot. That's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous thing to say. And I just think, Every time someone says that to me, I see a foot, I can't help it. Just hopping around on its own saying, I don't need anybody else. Yeah, you do. Because you're incomplete. You're an incomplete expression on your own. And the church brings together all these different parts and all these different gifts that the Holy Spirit pours out on us and all these different talents and all these different kinds of perspectives and together then it forms this great expression, ongoing expression uh, of Jesus Christ. When you say, I don't need anybody else, uh, it's me and Jesus, baby, or whatever, here's what you're saying you don't need. You don't need the blessing of, the, uh, of another person's perspective. <laughs> yeah. You're saying, I can do this on my own. I have completeness in myself. I don't know about you. I frequently talk to other people about issues. And man, sometimes I go, huh, never thought of it that way. And I find myself especially doing that with my grown-up children now. You know, they're, they're just, they got good perspectives on some things. And that's a blessing. When you say, I don't need the church, it's just me and Jesus, you're saying, I don't need the blessing of the community of saints. I need that. 
I'm a very independent person. Quarantine to me is just one step away from what I would normally do life like. <laughs> Honestly speaking, my wife pulls me into a lot more stuff than I would normally do and my kids do, but you know, I'm kind of a content individual. I can spend a lot of alone time and think life's pretty, pretty good. But you know what I noticed lately? I just need the community of saints. I just need fellowship. I just need somebody that's walking this road with me saying, hey, I'm with you on this. I'm going the same path. You know what I mean? And just talk about and have the mutuality. And see, we, we need the mutual encouragement of the body. We just need it. We desperately need it more than we realize. Um, and you know what else we experience here? If, if you say, it's just me and Jesus, what you're really missing out on is the family. It's the family of God. What a blessing to have other people that are really like kin folk, that are family, that you care about deeply. We're not meant to do this thing alone. We're meant to do this in community. I, I just see this at work all the time. I'm kind of an observer anymore, and I'll see people approach situations, and I begin to ascertain their spiritual gift by the way they react. So something happens to somebody, I'll go, oh, oh that's a mercy person, because they're just oozing with sympathy and compassion right now, and what a blessing. I wish I could feel those thoughts. Because I don't feel that kind of thought. I, I do, because I work at it. You follow what I'm saying? But you can tell a person that just genuinely has that giftedness, it just oozes out of them. They just like, you want to go up to them and just kind of sidle up to them and say, rub on me a little bit, you know? And, and then you see another one who's very prophetically gifted. They'll come to a situation and you're going, some truth needs to be spoken here. They'll speak that truth. Sometimes they need a mercy person to say, settle down now. You got tooth, but you're killing the person with your message, you know, and the two work really hand in hand. And then, you know, some have the gift of encouragement. My son, Nate, is a, a off the charts gifted, I think, with the spiritual gift of encouragement. And every time I talk to him, I'm going, it's kind of like refreshing. It's kind of like taking a drink after a long, long workout, you know, a big swig of water. You go, ah, I talk to him. I go, oh, my soul just goes, ah, oh, I feel so good because he's, Everything's kind of in perspective. Even when he, he went through COVID-19, he just had COVID-19 for two weeks. So I'm talking to him, how are you doing? Ah, good, you know, I don't feel good, but I'm okay. I thought, I'd be whining like a wild man right now. <laughs> and he near kind of, you know, and so it goes, I went out and trimmed some trees when everybody's gone and I just mask up and do everything, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I mean, just kind of like, wow, ah, okay. And so these different perspectives and giftedness, they come together, what do they give us? An ongoing representation, an ongoing look of Jesus Christ. And we get to have that with one another, and it's such a blessing. One of the real challenges that we face right now, and I'm going to speak to the people online because I have them watching this particular service, and those of you mainly doing church online, I want you to hear what I'm about to say to you. Now, I understand, first of all, that you're doing it online. I understand why, and I think that's great. I want to just say some things, so, especially to you, and I'm speaking to all of you here today too, okay, that are sitting with me in person you probably, if you're online, need to make a real great effort to stay in connection with other believers in some meaningful way. For the sake of you and for the sake of them. And I encourage you, I encourage you, make some kind of effort in this regard and don't wait for someone else to initiate, you initiate. You initiate, um, connect with someone, encourage someone, pray for someone, drop a note, do an email, text, Snapchat, whatever you guys do, just do it, you know what I mean? But take, take maybe set a goal. Um, again, you're going to see some of my personality bubble through here. Um, sometimes I think, you know what, I, I won't naturally connect with another human being unless I have to sometimes, you know? You guys hate it when I admit that as your pastor. So I'll say this week, I got I to gotta write five notes or I got to do 10 notes. I, I have to set a goal. Now this applies to everyone, whether you're online or sitting here in person. I think the body of Christ needs to start extending itself to other people. And we need to start blessing each other. And so drop somebody a note. Give them a text. Call them up. It's super easy. Say, I'm just thinking of you right now. I'm praying for you. Whatever it might be, just drop notes or whatever. Um, see them in the, when you see them, out there and about, stop for just a moment and say, how are you doing? And ask with sincerity, how are you doing? And listen to, to the answer. But at any rate, make effort to stay connected. So, the body of Christ, the church blesses us, you. Amen? Amen? Amen. 
You think it's good, right? Amen? Amen. Thank you. I like it. Yes. I remember coming. I'm going to, oh boy. It doesn't matter. All right. I remember first coming as a Christ follower. I was 13, and I really got into it when I was a teenager. I went to Souls Harbor, downtown Minneapolis, and I remember going to church services as a 17, 18, 19-year-old young man, and I remember the thinking oftentimes the pastor would say something, I'd go, I don't even have those questions. I don't even know to ask those questions. I don't even think about this kind of stuff, Amen. Because I was not in the faith. I didn't know. And so some, I found out in the body of Christ, one of the big benefits to me, especially as a young follower, was I didn't even know the questions to ask, much less the answer to them. I thought, oh, okay. And it, the body of Christ is such a blessing for its members. It really is. Don't ever, ever mitigate that or think it's less of it than you should. Let's go on the ongoing expression that blesses others. Let's talk on that side. Others are blessed by the ongoing expression of Jesus uh, through the church. So the first half of our short answer is who needs the church? You. The second half is others. We're talking on that part right now. Um, so if someone honkers out and says it's just me and the church, baby, what they're basically saying to the rest of the world is you can go to hell. I'm fine with Jesus and I'll care about you. But our founder hasn't allowed us to do that. Jesus is so concerned about others that the more you know him, the more you should become concerned about others. Um, we are blessed, church, to bless others. We are blessed to bless others. We know Jesus, and that's a huge blessing. And when we bring that situation of knowing Jesus to bear in whatever situation we find ourselves in, we bring that blessing to bear on others. In his first major teaching uh, called the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, got into this idea that we're called uh, to really minister to others. He's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says to his followers, you're to be salt and light. In other words, you're to be my flavor to the world, and you're to let the light of, of, of me illuminate your world you're in. Uh, he said specifically, let your light shine um, before people so they see your good deeds and praise your heavenly Father. Um, so right away, one of the first things Jesus says to his church, his people, is you're going to be salt and light to the world out there. And then he ends the teaching in Matthew. He begins the teaching in Matthew basically with the Sermon on the Mount. Then he ends his teaching in Matthew with this thing called the Great Commission. And he's still talking about the church blessing others. And I call this a mandate. The Great Commission blessing others is a mandate for the church. Listen to what Matthew 28 says, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know what? I, I have a rule of thumb when I read my Bible. When I hear a first mention of something, I, it grabs me. Okay. That, that's really important. Christ is mentioning to us as followers to be salt and light. And then when I hear a last mention of someone in the Bible, I think that's really important. And very, the, basically the last thing that Jesus says is, church, I'm giving you a mandate. Go make disciples. Bless other people. Uh, you know, bring me to bear on your culture. And so first and last mention here combine into this whole idea that we're, we're to be a church that's concerned with others. Jesus hasn't left us any option. Listen to this quote by Kevin Myers. It's from the book Grown Up Faith. He said this, the work of Jesus Church is the biggest thing happening on earth. What do you think of that? Amen. Amen. The work of Jesus Christ, the work of his church, is the biggest thing happening on earth. It's bigger than our political system. Amen. It's bigger than a pandemic, amen? amen? It's bigger than our economic woes, amen? amen. Do you believe that? Because this is what we're supposed to believe. Now listen, if you think church is just this Sunday morning, or if you think church is some kind of institution and kind of structure thing, you may be puzzled by the statement of Myers that the work of Jesus' church is the biggest thing happening on earth. But if you realize what the church really is, an ongoing expression of Jesus Christ by his followers, we're all parts, we're all the parts, all the people who love Jesus are involved in the picture of it, where you see yourself as part of it, and you realize that as a follower, wherever you go, 
there goes the church. Because what? You are the church. When you begin to realize these kinds of right aspects of church, the statement by Myers, the worker Jesus church is the biggest thing happening on earth will resonate with you. You'll go, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I see that. Because Jesus and his church, friends, are inseparable. It's not one or the other. It's a package deal that we have here. You just have to have the right understanding of church. Those who love Jesus are part of a body. We're part of a living organism called the church. We're family. Sure, there's the institutional side. There's some structure, but that doesn't define the church. This building is not the church. It's a building where the church meets. This building is an eternal, it's temporal. It's going to pass away, right? This isn't the church. You are the church. And you need to begin to see yourself as a living stone and part of the church of Jesus Christ. So when you exit the building today, the church has left the building. Amen? And I mean that with all my heart. I believe this is fundamentally good theology. When you leave the building today, the church has exited the building. I've had people come to me and say, Steve, I really like your church. (laughs) Don't ever say that to me. (laughs) I don't have a church. I know what they mean. I know they're well-intentioned, and I know they're just trying to give a compliment, but frequently I'll do just a gentle teaching there. Uh, This is the church of Jesus Christ. I'm just part of it. I'm just an under-shepherd of the great shepherd, but I don't have a church. We run into problems when pastors think they own the church. They don't own a church. Amen? I don't have a church. This is Jesus' church. So you have to understand, you're as much part of this church as I am. We're all part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So who needs a church? You and others. Let's talk about application. Because if you truly are the church and you're supposed to be concerned about others, let's take application. You have to live as a sent one. Do your life of the mission mindset then. Just begin to do your life of the mission mindset. On purpose, incorporate Christ into how you do your life and how you interact with others. As Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, we should be wise in the way we act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity with conversation full of grace and seasoned with salt. Man, I pray that. God... As I go about my day, and I pray this for you too, as our people here at this particular manifestation of your church called Grace Point, as we go about our day, God, I pray that we be opportunistic people who make every opportunity to engage and engage with outsiders in such a way, Lord, that we bring glory to your name. I'm praying for that right now, even though I just stumbled through what I was trying to say there. I just pray we're aware and we care and we see and we pray and we pray and we pray for others. If you don't seek God on behalf of your circle of influence, your circle of relationships, my question to you today is simply this, who will? That's your job. That's your part as a living stone in the church of Jesus Christ. You don't have to leave your neighborhood to be missionary. You just have to become a missionary where you're at. There's lots of opportunities. Let's go on to a second application. You are blessed to be a blessing. At minimal, show kindness to others. Your demeanor should change because you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, two, three weeks ago, whatever it was, I went back to the Vera Heart Hospital and I had uh, this corona artery follow-up thing, you know, ultrasound and all that. And I had to meet with Kelly, my uh, PA on this, all right? And so we're sitting there having conversation, I don't like to be there. Are you, you follow what I'm saying? How many of you like to go to the doctor? I hate it. You know, I just dread it. I get anxious. I have white coat syndrome terribly bad. Anybody relate to what I'm saying there? I think every time I go to you people, you just want to do something. You want to cut something up. I don't want to do that. So I'm sitting there talking to her, and I'm praying, Jesus, give me your demeanor. Give me your, you know, your attitude during how to interact here and all that. So then they do these write-ups now, these big write-ups from a viewer comes back to you, and it's all these portals and things. And I, I had to laugh at, at her write-up. I thought, I, I actually read it this time. I usually don't read it. Um, but she writes on there, Steve is a pleasant 63-year-old man. 
I said, I'll win. I'll take it. I know they say that about everybody, but I'll take it. I wasn't unpleasant and I wasn't critical and I wasn't a stinker. Amen? Amen. And sometimes, you know what? Small things are just victory. You are blessed, friends, to be a blessing. And listen to me. I want you to hear this. You have Jesus Christ. Man, don't ever undersell that. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, don't ever understand, don't ever undersell the implications of that and what you bring to a a situation and a relationship. Amen? You have blessings. You have insight. You have understanding. You have the mind of Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. These things are working on your behalf. You are blessed to be a blessing. Step into the power of it and into the authority of it and minister in the name of Jesus Christ because you're a living stone of the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I remember 11 years ago getting uh, called to come back to this church. I think you were on that committee, weren't you, Randy? Yeah. Anyway, uh, if you don't like it that I'm here, Randy Hanson, raise your hand. He's also the one in Revelation. So just be careful because you never know what's going to come then if you do that. But um, I, I, I was, when I was praying about coming back here, one of the things that touched my heart about Brookings uh, in my prior time here was I, I realized it was a sending church. It had a DNA of being a sending church from the get-go and raised up lots of pastors, I being one of them, from the congregation itself. And, you know, they went out and sent a lot of missionaries out into the missionary field and that kind of thing. And I thought, I want to come back to, I, yeah, I would not mind being part of a church that's got sending DNA in it. It's so important to have a church with sending DNA. And I really had an opportunity to, to reevaluate Oasis, which Pastor Ben over here is pastoring Oasis right now. And uh, he's the one sitting with the good looking girl over there. At any rate, um, I'm sorry. I don't know what, to, what my problem is today. I'm just, I think Aaron's gone and I lose focus, Lauren. Seriously. Anyway, Aaron's in Aberdeen. They're doing a pastoral interview today for a uh, pray for Aberdeen. They need to pastor. Anyway, um, and, and yeah, I'm just all over the map. I'm actually giving voice to the ADA thing that goes on in my mind that I normally don't do that. But one of the reasons I, I, I thought I'd come back is because I, I like the sending DNA of this church. And then I, I saw what was going on with Oasis at the time. And it was just starting to really explode. And I, I, how many of you know Oasis Ministry? Do you want to raise your hands right now? If you that look around the church, there's a lot of people that are involved. I, I'm, I tell you, there's nothing better that we can do than invest in this generation that's coming up. I'm going to cry. <laughs> there's nothing better that we could do than invest in you, knowing that most of you won't even be here when you graduate. That is an investment that's going to bless you and bless some other church. But that's the mindset Jesus wants us to have. Amen? Amen. And I am so glad for that ministry. I'm so glad for the multitude of young people that have come here and know Jesus Christ better when they leave and they go to some place and I'm assuming they're a blessing there. Amen? Amen. And that's the kind of church I want to be part of. And listen, I want to just expand your understanding of what it means to be sent. You are sent. Every single person in here is sent. You're sent to your neighborhoods, to your families. You have to be on mission. You have to have a missionary mindset. You're blessed with the filling of the person of the Holy Spirit if you follow Jesus Christ, and you can bring that to bear in whatever situation you find yourself on. You are sent. Amen? In fact, I want you to say that. I want you to say it at home. I didn't do this the first hour, but I want you to say, I'm sent. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. I'm sent. Take that serious. Let's go to our conclusion here, and I want to give you the big picture for the church because it's obvious here from this great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, there's this vision that Jesus has for the church. We're to make what? Make disciples. Okay, there's your blank. Make disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is one who is conforming to Jesus for the glory of Jesus Christ and for the sake of others. Did you hear that? One who is conforming to Jesus for the glory of Jesus Christ and for the sake of others. That's a super simple definition of disciple. You got to be vision driven as a follower of God. I remember having the privilege for 15 years to work in the design uh, project engineering side of the world. And I did a lot of machine designs. And the very first thing you had to do was come up with a concept to solve the problem. And then come up with basic design. You didn't start making parts. You didn't start fabricating things. You had to figure out what in the world you were going to do in order to make something. And you know what it taught me? 
the importance of vision, the importance of seeing the big picture. What are we doing here and why? And then everything finds its proper place and order. Um, And so, what are we doing, church? We're to make disciples. What's a disciple to look like? They're to conform to the image of Jesus Christ for the glory of Jesus Christ. When Randy looks like Jesus, the more he looks like Jesus, the more he brings glory to the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the sake of everybody else. For the sake of his family. For the sake of his marriage. For the sake of his business. For the sake of his friends. For the sake of his neighborhood. Amen? That's what we're about. This is the big picture, disciples. And this is what they look like. And ultimately, then we're the right expression of the church. And we bring glory to Jesus' name. And we minister grace to others. Conforming to Jesus, by the way, is a big honking statement. I've been reading a lot on vision lately. You got vision, mission, all that kind of stuff. You know that kind of order if you're into that. But vision is usually not meant to have a succinct statement. It's, it's meant to be kind of big and hairy and audacious and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, you know, that statement, conforming to Jesus Christ, means so much. It's so pregnant with meaning. You got this understanding that you're to love like Jesus loved. He loved so much, he died. You're to serve like Jesus served. He said, I don't do my will, I just do my Father's will. So the more we do the will of Jesus and just do the will of Jesus, the more, the more we look like him. And then Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. And we're called the sacrifice as we follow after him. This is what conforming to Jesus means. And Jesus was obedient in every jot and tittle. He fulfilled everything perfectly. And you and I are to follow God obediently. So when we use that term conforming to Jesus, it's huge in its implications, amen? And then not only that, it means that you and I are filled with the person of the Holy Spirit. And he's equipping us. And he's convicting us. And he's putting God's thoughts into our minds. And he's enabling us with his power and and giftedness, you know? And that's what it means to be conforming to Jesus Christ. And when we are those kind of followers, guess what? It brings glory to Jesus. And it also blesses others. Why do we need the church? It's good for you, and it's good for others. I need to quit, so I'm going to stop. Let's pray. Lord God, I want to thank you for this day and this opportunity to talk for a few moments on church. And we're, we're, we're a perfect, perfect example of church today. we got this huge gathering here today in person. We've got this huge gathering that's looking online. It's not a method. It's heart. It's seeing ourselves as living stones. It's stepping into the ministries and the calling that you have for each one of us, Jesus. It's understanding that it's bigger than us. And it's understanding, Lord, that we work in fellowship with the other saints. And so I pray today, Lord, that we would understand that we're to be this ongoing expression of you, Jesus. And it's a blessing to us, as we've been saying today, to you. And it's a blessing to others, to the world. And God, I pray that we would be that church. That we'd be truly alive in you, Jesus. Authentically following you. And Holy Spirit, fill our hearts. Equip us to be this kind of a church. I just want Grace Point and I want its affiliations and everyone associated with us, everyone watching online today, Lord. I just want us just to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength to serve you, Lord, with joy and gladness, to be aware and care about others around us, to understand that we're filled with Jesus and we have the best gift we can offer anybody by just having that understanding and that perspective. And God, I know that you said, don't worry about what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit will speak through us. And sometimes I think we try to work everything out when instead we just, wanna, we just need to be in you and just be recklessly following after you, Lord. And I just pray that would be us. Now as we close with the song, would you bless this moment? Make it a moment of uh, just delineation, of a moment of putting a stake in the ground and saying, we're following you hard, Jesus. We're the church. And when we leave today, God, may we go with this idea, the church has exited the building. We're gone. But the church is not gone. Because the church is us. We love you, Jesus, and we praise your name. And all God's people said, 